one. Good? Yep. When I was in third grade, Becky O'Neill called me stupid because I wrote my J's backwards. I told her, J is a hard letter. You never know whether to hook left or hook right. A right hook from Ashton Bellman in junior high was meant to swell me up and make my tiny nose normal sized. At least, that's what he told me. And in high school, Ryan Mundy called me many things I dare not repeat, but still replay in my head from time to time, all because I did theater instead of playing football. Sticks and stones, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words... A stone I can take. A quick break, yeah, that I can shake. And though you've never punched me in the face, every syllable you speak stabs through my spirit and hardens my heart. And though my hand makes the cut, your words are the accomplice. Seeking to accomplish I know not what other than to bury some sense of loathing you have for your own self. I know you hate yourself so much. Otherwise, you wouldn't be so obsessed with hating me more. No eye has seen and no ear has heard just how much I care about what you think of me because I would never show anyone other than the darkness of my bedroom and tear-stained pillowcase. Just in case mom and dad could hear my cries, I suffocated my suffering in a cotton case grave and believed all the lies you told me about who I am or what I would become or whose fault it was. It got worse when your fingers started saying what your mouth was too cowardly to utter. Under the influence of your description of me, I learned to despise many things about myself. Not because they're so bad, but because if I didn't have them, then you wouldn't have noticed them and be powerless to use them against me. The pricks and pins of pricks' opinion spins my whole sense of self out of whack, and so I shacked up in the safest place possible on the island of invisibility, on the shore of don't make any waves. At the corner of complacency and fitting in, I hide in the back country of cowardice, praying you won't notice this insecurity factory I call a life, or a family, or a faith, or a body. And even today, I'm not lying when I say I could care less about what people think of me, because I could. I could care much, much less because I still care a whole lot. But you are not my source. You are not my well. If your opinion of me were the last cup of water in a desert, I would throw it in your face. And even though there's still a trace of the pain you caused, those scars are hard as armor and so faint that sometimes I can't even see them anymore. Because the sticks that used to harm me have been crossed. The stone that used to bruise me has been rolled away. Sticks and stones were your weapon, but sticks and stones are his way. So say all you want, a better word has been spoken. Lie all you need to, a greater truth has been revealed. Hold me back if you must, but my future has been sealed. Sticks and stones, right? Yeah, that's such a powerful video, isn't it? Josh found that, and we were like, yep, yep, that's it. So we're going to pray and just leave, because that's all we need to hear today. No. <laughs> My name is Emmy Salisbury. I am the youth pastor, and yes, I'm extremely happy about the bus. So thank you. Thank you for partnering with us in that we could buy that. Uh, I am here with our lead servant, Josh Gray. And guys, I believe that we should be a people to give honor when honor is due. <clears throat> and Josh is a lead servant. 
what I have seen with my time here on staff and just knowing him as my friend, Josh practices what he preaches. Our senior pastor has scrubbed the staff bathroom from top to bottom as a way of serving us on staff. He comes into our offices and empties our garbage. Before you guys even get here on snowy days, he's the one outside without a coat on, shoveling the lines so we can park smartly. I am honored, and this will probably be my last time up here because I have the microphone and I'm doing this and he'll never ask me back. I am honored to have him lead us because we're being led by a servant. And when he comes up here and calls himself that, it's not just some nice, oh, he's a lead servant. He's doing it. And I'm thankful for that. So I wanted to edify him in front of all of you because he edifies us as, all the time as staff members. And so it's my turn. So thanks, Josh, for, for doing what you say. <clears throat> We are going to put a lovely bow on this three-part series of Sticks and Stones. It's been so good, hasn't it? I have been challenged at home when I want to say something to my kids. I'm like, Ooh, tuck that back in. Josh opened up the first week and showed us that God spoke with his word. He created with his spoken word and that our words matter. And then Greg last week did a wonderful job of showing us that our words have the power of life. And through our root systems, if we, if we bring in something toxic, we're gonna get toxic results and it's gonna spread to everybody else. But if we bring in nutrients, then the rest of us get to flourish along with you. And today, we're gonna open up the conversation of what do we do when we have been spoken over and said things that should have never been spoken over us? What do we do with the curses that have tattooed our hearts in ways that should have never been tattooed? Well, for our conversation today, we're gonna start at the very beginning. I wanted to go back. What was the very first time that blessing and curses were brought up in the Bible? And we go back to the book of Deuteronomy. And, and to set the story for this passage in Deuteronomy, we have to look at what's going on. Moses has just visited with God on Mount Sinai. He's been given the Ted Commandments. God says, Moses, this is how you and me, we're gonna interact. I need you to go down to the Israelites and share this with them. So Moses goes down and he says, guys, this is what God says looks like to be in relationship with him. And it goes into detail. There are a lot of different ways that the Israelites get to partner with God and to join him in what it looks like to be his people. Well, then Moses brings his Israel, the Israelites' people, his people, to go into the promised land. And he's going to open up this whole conversation with a picture. And Josh is going to lead us to what that picture is. Thanks, Emmy. So, yeah, this is more than just a, a, it's even more than just a conversation. This is a, a covenantal relationship. This is a big deal. This is life or death as he's leading uh, his people. And so he wants to do this like every uh, good teacher does. You have something to point at. And I had a really cool analogy with like uh, Steptoe Butte and um, Moscow Mountain. And then it kind of blew apart in our sermon club. We're like, no, that doesn't really work. So we'll stick with the one that we have here. Uh, but he really wants to give us a visual picture. And wouldn't that be cool if you had an absolute like visual picture before the words left your mouth, whether that was a blessing or that was a curse that came out of your mouth? And I thought about that a lot this week. And I was like, man, wouldn't that be great? And then I remembered that we do have that. And I remembered it because we did a sermon series on the Holy Spirit. And you have an advocate that's going to work within you, that's going to let you know, like, before those words come out of your mouth, is that something that's, are you speaking life into somebody? Or are you speaking death? Are you speaking blessing into somebody? Or are you speaking curse? But he wanted to give a picture of this. Uh, and so we'll see this here in Deuteronomy. It says, see... I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. The curse is if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God 
and turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods which you have not known. God's love language is obedience. He wants us to to obey him, not to control us, not to make us robots because he knows what's best for us, right? And so do you want to be under God's blessing or do you want to be out of his his care, out of his blessing, and you want to be in in the curse world where you you can't control that, right? And so uh, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessing and on Mount Ebal the curses, So he gives them this word picture here. And he says, uh, as you know, these mountains are across the Jordan, westward towards the setting sun, near the great trees of Moray, uh, in the territory of those Canaanites living under Arabah in the vicinity of Gilgal. You are about to cross the Jordan to enter and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you have taken it over and are living there, be sure that you obey all the decrees and laws that I am setting before you today. Because he wants you to have a blessing over your life, to be able to know what that looks like. So here's the mountains. Uh, Stage left, that's Gerasim, and stage right, that's Ebal. And uh, at that time, with uh, the one on the left had more nutrients and more the way that the weather hit it and the weather patterns hit it, and the one on the right was less. And so they would be like, okay, you six tribes go over here, and you six tribes over here, and blessings and curses and blessings and curses. And I think some of those trees are uh, native to Colorado. And when I went to Israel, (laughs) you're like, man, there's lots of trees here. These look really cool. And then you're like, yeah, those are from Colorado. Well, I thought I got away from America to go here, but so the, the trees, but it looked different, right? It looked different. So they want to have a visual, uh, a visual thing in your mind to understand blessings and curses. When we talk about sticks and stones, what are we to be a people of? Why would we want to obey and speak blessing over people? Because if we claim to be God's people and we claim to be Christ-like, we would be a people that would go forth and speak blessings. And what if that happened here in Moscow? And what if that happened in Poland? What if that happened in, in Palouse and Potlatch and all those things that all of you were to go out and you were to see the good and speak blessings into people? Wouldn't we be more like our Savior? Yeah, and I love that we have this picture of what it looks like to live in blessing and what it looks like to live in curses. And you and I, we have the freedom to live on either side. But with the words that we say, we're going to bring along the people with us to the side of blessing or the side of curses. Our words have power. Jewish tradition, and even even today, and I've seen it in my own life, our words have the power that releases heaven and comes and obligates what we say, and heaven partners with us. Our words are very powerful. And and we're gonna talk about how those direct curses affect us, but we're also gonna take kind of a sidestep and talk about what about those indirect things we say, our body language. And we're gonna bounce back and forth on, on what we're talking about here. And when we're talking about curses, we're not talking about hexes or magic spells. We're talking about those things that somebody says that, that obligates the heavens or our path to be different than what God intended. Do you guys remember the saying on the playground, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks onto you? Yes, this is reality. See, the choice that we have to speak blessing or curses, we also have the choice to receive it or, or reject it. I've seen this played out in my own life. Uh, if you know my story, my husband and I's story, we had a very interesting dating experience and I was very young uh, and we had a lot of opinions about whether or not us even dating, getting engaged and getting married was the right thing to do. We had so many people come to us and say, you guys are so stupid, what are you doing? I had two family members, two, uh, you know, Extended family members come to me and said, your marriage is absolutely doomed. You are doing the stupidest thing ever. And John and I, we stood there and we said, absolutely not. We reject both of those curses. 
We knew that us getting married, me at 18, was probably very dumb. I was very young, but we said, God has brought us to this point and we believe that whatever we face, we're gonna go to the Lord and figure it out with him, not what you guys say. And we rejected both of those curses. And unfortunately, both of those people, those couples that said that to us, they are no longer married to their spouses at that time. John and I had the power to reject that curse. And we did. This summer will be 20 years. What we say matters. What we say obligates our direction and people partnering with us to go in a different direction. And we, as a church, as a family, as people, what we say does the same thing to who we say it to. And even more so is our body language. And there's this concept that, they, that the Jewish people talk about a lot in the Midrash, and that is the commentary of Torah to the rabbis, this is the second most thing that they talk about. First one is Sabbath. Sabbath is very important. The second thing is the words we say. And Josh is gonna unpack that for us. Yeah, good word. So, so say this with me, uh, Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara. So this is what they talk about in the, in the Midrash, uh, second most, like uh, Emmy had said. So there's a definition of Lashon Hara. Any form of speech or nonverbal communication that lowers another person's status. Lashon Hara doesn't just include gossip or telling lies. It is even more commonly used to describe telling negative truths about others. There are some negative truths about me that I would appreciate is not broadcast across, across the, the, the body. I got holes in my game as a pastor. I have holes in my game as a father. I have holes in my game as a husband. And they're true of me at this time. So if we get to shine the light on all of the negative truths, you know, I, I wouldn't like that. And I was, uh, as I was thinking about this this week, I'm like, what does this look like? Uh, you know, what are some other things that we would see? It can be identifying a person for a mistake where you're calling them that mistake. That's their name now, or weakness. Speaking over them, especially as a parent, uh, a poor virtue. Your, your room's always messy. You live like a pig. Hmm, guess what you've spoken into existence. You know what, Tom? Uh, your room, your room is not, it's not, it doesn't characterize you. I, I see you as somebody who takes care of things. I see you as somebody who values and takes care of the stuff that you have. Huh. So as we think about Lashon Hara in our own families, it can even be an angry, fixed look such as a glare. Not even words out of your mouth. How about that? It can be the silent treatment. This is when our counselors get the most nervous about marriages is when something happens called stonewalling, where they're the most nervous of whether they can help, help move that marriage and bring it back together when one person is just like, you're not, even, you're not even worth a response to me. There's something in the heart that's really, really happened to get to that point. Um, also, when, uh, like, the, this phrase of, like, when the, uh, someone is so embarrassed, the whitening of the face is what they call it. Someone is so embarrassed that the blood leaves their face and they turn white. I remember this happening to my cousin. Uh, we went to a Catholic school in California, and there were folks that were of a different income level than what my parents were. My parents were blue-collar workers, and they were of a different income level. And so my dad would get these awesome $500 cars um, from his workplace. And we had an orange Dodge Duster once that on, he's like, hold that door on left-hand turns because that door would go flying open <laughs> on left-hand turns. So I'm like a little kid in there going like, yeehaw, okay, <laughs> hold that door. And then uh, this one time he came to pick up my cousin and I, and she was a year older, and he had this beautiful Ford Pinto runabout 
It had, uh, it was the round one. It had two uh, different colored side doors and a different color hood. And so he was coming to pick us up. My dad was coming to pick us up. And my, uh, my cousin was trying to fit into the people. And there were much different cars in the parking lot picking up kids than a, two, uh, a three-tone uh, Ford Pinto runabout. And so we pick up, and I'm right there. I don't care. I'm a guy. I don't I'm like paying attention to that stuff. So I get in the hey, Dad, another new car. Do I have to hold the door on this one? Um, and so I get in the car, and then my dad gets out, and he's pretty redneck, and he's like, Angela! And she's over there with her friends that all have different kind of cars than we have. It's your Uncle Al! Come on, we got to go! <laughs> and the whitening of a 12-year-old's face who's trying to fit in with a different group of people as she comes back to the car. Like, for sure, for sure. I was asking the Lord, too, this week as we were studying this, I was like, so what other, like, give me some more examples, Lord. What What could I see? Give me some real life examples. So we think about the dust of Lashon Hara, and it doesn't just apply to our words, but also making faces, Think about this. Think if you maybe observed anything this week that you would think like this could be the dust of Lashon Hara. Making faces, uh, rolling eyes, sarcasm, purposely embarrassing, winking, under the breath snickers, chuckles, innuendos. So I got a chance to watch part of the State of the Union. The Lord gave me that example of Lashon Hara, right? And it's not about, this is not political about who's, because I've seen it happen on both sides of those things. So the first example that I see was like, here's my, here's my speech, and yeah, you're not even worth, you're not even worth shaking hands. I'm like, okay. And the second uh, example, you see this behind there, right? So there, so there's the people that are that are there, and the mic, like, and then the other person's like, like about to about to puke. The person didn't use the words that you're supposed to use the words to announce the, the president. But you see this at our highest, our highest level of government. And this is not political. It's not which side you fall on. But like, we're called to be better than that. Doesn't matter what the issues are. Like, that's the dust of Lashon Hara. Like, that's the example that the world gets to see And we have opportunities as Christians to walk differently, to understand that our emotions, our eye rolls, everything about us says who our God is. And what are we putting on display in our own families? What are we putting on display in our own workplaces? What are we putting on display in our own community? That's why God put this sermon series on my heart a long time ago because I knew what time of the year and cycle of election stuff that we're going to be going through and what are we going to look like and and everybody should vote and everybody should have their opinion but how are you handling that? Mm -hmm. People have value even if they don't think like you. We should be like that. We should be different. That's good. If I were to ask you guys to close your eyes and to think about something that somebody has done or said over you that lowered your status, that embarrassed you, that made you feel really bad, that you felt devalued over, how long would it take you to come up with a word? My guess is not very long at all. See, mine, the most recently, was that I was too much. And what that did was cause me to get really, really small. I wasn't obedient to what God was calling me to do by stepping out and stepping up because I was too afraid of being too much to you, to my family, to my friends. So what do we do? What do we do with those things that have been put upon us, that we have taken on, that we haven't rejected because we do have that choice? that we've taken on and now we're living out that curse. I think we have one more mountain that we need to visit. 
because I think this mountain is gonna give us all the answers. And I think visiting this mountain, we will find extreme healing and freedom in. And that mountain is called Calvary. And see, there is this thing called a cross that stood on Calvary that as, as its essence was a curse. To die to this death, crucifixion on a cross was horrendous. I think how Jesus handled the cross gives us some tools and some freedom from those things that we're carrying today. Let's look at some scripture. In Luke, it says, when they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Is that right? Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserved. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then, Jesus, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. As Jesus hung there on the cross, he wanted us to know that we have to forgive. We have to forgive. Forgive that person who said that curse over you. Forgive your parents who said something and created something and you are now living that out. Create the, or forgive the kid in high school that said something that you are still carrying. Forgive. And that doesn't mean come, come reconciled again, to bring back, to restore that relationship how it was. But what that does mean is you have to forgive. Because in forgiveness, we partner with the cross. That was one of the main messages of the cross was forgiveness. We are the ones with the benefit of forgiveness because we get set free when we forgive. Amen. What do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? Let's continue. In John, it says, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. What was important on the cross? Each other. Community. Taking care of one another. That's what we get to do here. That's what we get to do in our home groups. So we get to do life with one another. And we get to start speaking blessing over those curses. We get to start bringing them out into the light and having people say, that's not who you are. We need people. Isolation is dangerous. It's so important. That was just one of the three things that Jesus said on the cross. Take care of each other. We've got to take care of each other. Then in Matthew, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is not Jesus saying, oh man, here we are. I don't know how we got to this place, but you gotta figure something out. I'm really angry. No, this was Jesus' death passage. Every rabbi had a death passage that they wanted to utter with their last breath. This was what Jesus wanted to be known for as a rabbi. And what's very important to know is that the disciples that were around Jesus knew exactly what was next. See, this is just a small little fraction of what Jesus wanted. When you speak text, when a rabbi would say the one thing, what they really meant was what came next. And we have to go there. We have to go into this death passage to know what Jesus was saying. 
And this is found in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. What Jesus was saying on the cross is, God, you got a bigger plan than all of this. You're gonna rescue me, and I delight in you. When, we, when curses come upon us, do we worship? That's not my first response. But Jesus did. He trusted God. He said, this is not what defines me. This is not my name. I'm not taking in on this. But God, you're gonna deliver me, and I'm gonna delight in you. And we also find in the passage that there were some air quotes above Jesus' head. King of the Jews. They weren't labeling him. They were making fun of him. How many times have you joked with yourself with friends and said, well, I just have idiot on my forehead? You just gave yourself a title. Guys, the cross of Jesus conquered any title that you put on your forehead. It conquered everything that somebody spoke over you that should have never been spoken over you. The blood of Jesus that covered the cross says that that thing that somebody said over you, that's not who you are. Who you are is who I am. He turned that curse of a cross into a blessing. And that's where you and I get to partner with him. That's where you and I get to go find healing at the foot of the cross because the blood of Jesus covers every single thing that somebody said over us that should have never been said over us. And what's awesome is it doesn't stop there. The blessing of the cross turns into the power of the resurrection. So I want you guys to think of sticks and stones forever differently. And it's in that video, you know, we have these sticks and stones that are used to, to harm us, and yet those sticks were turned into a, a cross. And our Savior was on that cross. And those stones, like they said, the stones were rolled, the stone was rolled away. And when that stone was rolled away, freedom was, was, was released. Freedom from uh, the bondage, freedom from all those things that somebody has ever said about you or that you said about yourself or that was spoken into your life. Do you know there's generational curses that your dad's dad told him and your dad's dad and your dad's dad and your mom's mom, your, they're generational curses and you have the freedom to break those. You do not have to live in those curses. Mm-hmm. Somebody's got to break the curses. Every family probably has them. So who's going to step up and break those curses? Who's going to turn the the sticks into the cross? And who's going to allow the freedom of the, the, the stone that is moved away, the stones that are off of you? What do you want? I want freedom. And that freedom comes in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Like to be free. And that's what people want. There's people tonight that are, or this morning that woke up that are hungover. And they're trying to wipe out their hangover in their, in their bedroom and their kids are sitting there watching who knows what on TV, right? And they need to meet you. They need to have freedom. Those kids need to be learning about Jesus. And they maybe did things and said things that they regret. I know I had plenty of Saturday nights, Sunday mornings in my life that were like that, but we have a whole group of people out there that need to be spoken blessing over and be called out their potential. That's what we do is we call out people's potential. And God has touched our very hearts and touched our very lips. And Isaiah here says, uh, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. 
For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm living among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Your eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with an, a live coal in his hand, which had, he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Go. Mm -hmm. Go. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. You have freed me. Send me. Send us. That's what we're here for. We're not here to get a better truck, a bigger house. Like, that's all cool. Maybe that's how the Lord's going to work it through you. But you're here to go, to go forth and to share how God changed your life, how he touched your lips and it came into your heart. And what comes out of our heart is, is a heart of blessing. And I just pray over this body. That's what we want to be. We want to be a church that speaks blessing. We already are. We're awesome already. I'm speaking blessing over our church right now that we're going to go out into the community this week and we're going to lift people up. Mm-hmm. We're going to see the positive. We're going to continue to go out in our community. We're going to continue to love on the schools. We're going to continue to love on everyone around here. And we're going to continue to to build this community up in the name of Jesus, not the name of real life. Mm -hmm. Amen. In the name of Jesus, not the name of some pastor. That God would be glorified. You know there's people like we have something worth people inviting people to on a Sunday. We have pretty, we, like we outkicked our coverage on worship. We have some pretty amazing worship. We get occasional good message up here too. And God's moving here. Like, we have something great to invite people to. We have something great for them to be involved in during the week because our God is great, and we're just trying to point and follow him the best we can. Your your sticks and stones matter. Look at them differently for the rest of your life. The sticks and stones that God used to build you, to create you into his purpose and his plan. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to take in this time and go uh, to the words and to, to, to communion. So if you're serving communion, thank you very much. Go ahead and head back there. Um, we do communion every week. If you're new here, you're just checking us out. You're like, this is crazy. Well, cool. That's us. Welcome. We found your people. Um, you found your people. And so uh, we take communion every week, but we do so in a manner that's worthy. We examine our hearts. We examine who we are, and we're going to take it all together. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just let this pass on by. It won't mean anything to you anyway. But we're going to hold it all together. Let's go over some, some implications and some, uh, some questions that you may want to share in your home groups this week uh, that you may want to share sitting around the table uh, with your spouse. So how does Deuteronomy eleven twenty six through 32, what we read today, and then what uh, Greg talked about last week, James uh, 3, 9 through 12, how do they inform, uh, help you inform your understanding of blessings and curses? So you're going to have to go read those over. You'll read those again. What does that look like? Are you a person who is characterized by blessings. You receive blessings. You speak blessings upon people. This isn't name it and claim it stuff. This is just being a Christian. Or do you find that you're a person that's kind of stuck in the cursing world and not cursing just with your mouth and foul language, but cursing like not speaking well of others? What does that look like? Our, question, our second question is, how has partaking and receiving Lashon Hara impacted you and those around you? About five years ago, I found myself in the middle of a mess. Uh, just admit, I love shopping. I love shoes and purses and all the cute things, and I just like to feel fancy. But it was affecting my marriage, my family, having to hide credit card bills and packages in the mail. I knew something was not right. So I started the very long process, good process, of figuring out why this had such big control of my life. It went back to this one moment. My senior year of high school, Moscow High, third floor government class, I sat in the front right corner and the pencil sharpener was the back left corner. And I made my way back there to sharpen my pencil, and I heard underneath a breath, the breath of one of my classmates, if I had to dress like her, I would kill myself. 
how I dressed, I was worthy or unworthy of the air I breathed. And that changed the course of several years of my life. It took away money from my husband and my children. One simple comment took years of addiction and heart space that God couldn't move in my life. What is it that one simple comment, eye roll, nudge, funny face, potentially has set the course of somebody's life years to work their way out of? We need to be mindful of how innocent it looks now, but how devastating it could be to a family years down the road. Yeah, I've just moved on that. I mean, to, to just, the Lord's gonna just reveal to us in some of our places, areas that we've been harmed and hurted, hurt, and other places where we might've hurt someone. And I just encourage you to, to make it right. Give the gift of freedom to somebody else if God puts Amen. that on your heart in an area where you might have said something that you, he reveals to you that affected somebody else and go make it right. Give them the freedom from that. Speak blessing back over that. Take it back. And make it right. So uh, speaking of things, that the blessing pieces of it, what are some experiences you've had with someone speaking positive truth and uh, blessing over you? How did it affect your thoughts and beliefs from that point in life? How has it affected other people's lives? When I was 19, except of the Lord, my mentor said, Josh, I see in you a great servant. You serve people well. You put others before yourself often. I was like, you do? Okay. <laughs> like, okay. I guess I do. And they spoke that in my life, and there I go. Right? And I'm still trying to honor that years and years later. So when you think about that, what, what are you speaking blessing over uh, in other people's lives? What does it look like for you sharing that? What, is, what has somebody said about you that is good and true that you've adopted and you've taken on in your life? The next question. With Luke 23, Matthew 27, and Psalm 22 in mind, how does the cross influence your words? What are some ways the cross influences our community's vision to reach the world with the love of Jesus? As you and I go to the cross to find healing, and we bring those things as we talked about before, the, that one thing that you identified today, as we go to the cross and we let the blood of Jesus cover that and heal us, we then get to turn and offer healing to the next person. Because I believe most people, all people, have something tattooed on their heart. They have a void from something somebody spoke negatively over them. And as you and I start to get healed, we speak healing. And we start to fill up somebody's heart. And out of the overflow, like Greg talked about, the heart's gonna start to speak blessing. And I want in on that. I want to be in on a group of people that heals people with the words that we say. I want to be a person that starts to speak stick and stone. And I want to just prophesy, just claim that we become a people that start to speak cross and resurrection. Mm -hmm. So as we speak cross and resurrection, we come to uh, the time when Jesus says, with his disciples and he's getting ready to, to let them know, hey, I want you to remember what I'm about. And as we try and remember what he's about, we, we, and the, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he, he broke it and he said, this is my body and this is for you. Do this in remembrance for me. Do you remember what he's like? Do you remember that he is a God of blessing? We remember you. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink. Do it in remembrance for me. Remember what he was like. Father, thank you for this time. I just ask, Lord, that you would just, this word would just be upon people in a mighty way. Thank you for our worship that we had and that we're going to have. Uh, and just help us walk this out. Help me walk it out. Help us walk it out. We want to be a church 
a group of people that represents you well and that speaks blessings and sees potential in other folks. Lord, break the curses that are upon these people in this room. Help them identify it and help them reject that stuff that is not true of them. Speak boldly into their lives in a mighty, mighty way, Father God. We need it in Jesus' name. Amen.